Welcome to the Global Good Podcast, where each week we'll travel around the globe meeting the most incredible people doing the work that's truly making the world a better place. From the peaks of the Himalayas to leagues under the sea, join us as we embark on adventure for good. Currently, One in every four children in the world lack access to enough nutritious food. While hundreds of millions go undernourished or are chronically hungry, the number is expected to increase as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Although women and girls are the majority of food producers and food providers in their homes, they're often the last to eat and their specific nutritional needs go unmet. When families are forced to make difficult decisions, it's often the girls who are harmed from child marriage to forced labor to other forms of human trafficking. Girls consistently pay the price of food insecurity. Of the 600 to 800,000 people trafficked across international borders each year, 70% are female and 50% of children. But what if providing a basic human right, food, to girls in need could prevent exploitation and give them the nutrients they need to develop properly. That's the exact mission one man, born in India, set out to pursue. When Dr. Ambush Jain founded Feed a Billion, he knew food security was vital to breaking cycles of poverty, as well as enabling girls to stay with their families and to go to school and thus live up to their potential. This week, We're headed to Muzaffarnagar, in the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, where Dr. Jain, who goes by AJ, was born in 1960. Welcome, AJ. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you, Nicole. Good. I'm really excited to have you here um, and to go on this journey with you. And I think that's really what today's going to be. It's a journey about you and Feed a Billion. And, you know, particularly as we record this, we've passed the one year mark of the coronavirus pandemic and the newest estimates I've seen that in this one year, we've had more than a decade of progress lost when it comes to food security, that ability for people to know where their meals are coming from during the week and how they feel, you know, how they go about their daily lives when they don't know where food is going to come from. And particularly, you know, your area of expertise, how that impacts children and particularly girls around the world. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to learn from you. So let's go back to the very beginning. Uh, take us to your home. Take us to India uh, and, and, you know, introduce us to AJ, not Dr. Ambush Jain, but AJ uh, and your family and where you come from. Sure. Um, thank you. So I, what, what I'm going to talk about is from about seven years of age, um, okay. because we had moved back to where my family is from, and it's a town called Muzaffarnagar, and it's in a state called Uttar Pradesh. And if Uttar Pradesh, which is referred to as UP, if you separate it out from India and it became a separate country, it will be the fifth most populated country in the world. So there's about 220 million people in that That's state insane. that is, I think, the size of Texas, if you can kind of figure that out. You know, it's uh, the population density is unthinkable. And when we moved back, we moved to our family home. And, and picture a home with a big courtyard in the middle, three levels, three floors, and rooms all around the courtyard on all floors. And the way the rooms were is there was not a lot of interconnected rooms. So in order for you to go from, for example, the living room to where the kitchen area was, you had to go out into an open um, terrace sort of a thing and walk and that terrace sort of a thing was about two feet wide maybe or two two and a half feet wide so that was the scene and in the house there were three primary families which were all related and our family itself which was my uncle's family and my 
my dad's family, our family. Mm-hmm. In total, there were, I think about, I was trying to count, I think there were about 18 people, but in the whole house, there are 30 plus people. And there were two toilets and no running water. <laughs> so you do the imagining of how bad it was. No, there I was, just got stuck. Like there's like a glitch in my brain. <laughs> it's, it's unthinkable. More it's than 30 people un- and yes. two toilets. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> let me let me paint another picture. No cooking gas. So in this tiny kitchen where it was not a standing kitchen, it was uh, sitting on the floor kitchen on this little stool. And the fire had to be lit early in the morning, either a wood fire or coal fire. There was no water heater. So in the winter time, the water had to be boiled for people to take uh, a shower. There was no shower head. It was a tap water, which you had to fill the water in a bucket and you had to sit on this little stool thing and you know go with a little, um, uh, what do you call a, we used to call it a mug mm-hmm. and you had to put the water on your head. There was no dishwasher. So the dishes had to be hand washed for all the people. Every meal was cooked breakfast, lunch and dinner and a midday tea. Everything was cooked. There was no packaged food. Um, There was no water heater. There was no laundry machine. There was no dryer. There was no air conditioning. There was no heat. So when it was hot, the heat came in. When it was cold, the cold came in. When it rained, the rain came in because the courtyard was in the middle and no TV. So why I paint that picture is think about all the women my aunt, my mom, my two cousins' wives, and occasionally my other couple of cousins who are a little bit older than us, they all helped in the kitchen, in this tiny kitchen. And they worked in starting in the morning, getting the breakfast ready, getting the kids out to school, getting the men out to their respective workplaces. And uh, the same thing happened for lunch and the same thing happened for dinner. It was just mayhem. I mean, just think about the movement of just cutting the vegetables. I mean, it's a full-time job. uh, It's more than a full-time job. And what was interesting is that it was all women doing this work, and there was a distance between the kitchen because kitchen was in the corner, and there was a distance between the kitchen and the living room where people sat and ate. So... And, and the food has to be hot. The bread that is served, the roti, it has to be hot. So there's this running going on, constant back and forth for all these meals. And the way the meals worked was um, the kids ate, the men ate, and then the women ate. But by the time the women ate, nobody else was paying attention to them. Like, I mean, they yeah. will just sit down on the kitchen floor and they will just eat as fast as they could because there was turnaround time, right? You had to start getting ready for the thing. There was no laundry machine. So the laundry had to be done by hand, the hand washing. There was no dryer. So the clothes had to be hung. I mean, it was a lot of work for these women. You say was, but I would actually argue is. I mean, a lot has changed in the last 50 years, but so much hasn't from gender roles to access to things like stoves and washing machines. And, you know, that's true all over the world. And yet women have always been and remain the bedrock of their families and communities. Uh, But you know what I also heard is what you're saying is that you've always had a relationship with women and with food. (laughs) Yes. And, And it's really my mom. You know, she is this absolutely incredible soul. This That's beautiful amazing. human being. You know. But so then you moved to the U.S. You also went to university. You became very successful. You got a doctorate. Um, you know, your career was remarkably successful. And then there was a time that it wasn't. Uh, and I, I know you uh, not too long ago did uh, the Crazy Money podcast with, with yes. Paul Olinger. Yeah. So um, if anyone wants to hear a bit more about his, you know, career, uh, it's a really great interview about your journey. Um, So, you know, maybe tell us a a bit more about that, because, um, you know, I know you and you're very observant and you're very empathetic. 
Um, you know, but was there a moment in your journey or was it a series of moments, events that brought you to a place where you wanted to focus on food and food security? Yeah. Um, so for some reason, I felt that it is important for a person to have something as basic as food because without it not much can happen and i volunteered at um, a kitchen in uh, atlanta which is where i live and um, and we I had to deliver food to uh, these um, different families different places mm -hmm. and there was one in particular that um I had never experienced, you know, I've been in the States, but I've lived, I've lived a very sheltered life because, you know, I've been a professional and I've lived in affluent areas and, and didn't really know a lot about what, what is going on in certain parts of the country, in certain parts of a city. And as I went to a certain part of Atlanta, which I had never been in before, I was absolutely shocked at the living conditions of Americans. <laughs> yeah. The infrastructure of these neighborhoods, the homes. It was shocking to me right here in Atlanta. Yeah. And I was at, um, I had to deliver food to this one home, a tiny home, and picture it's fenced and picture, you know, it's kind of rickety fence. And the windows, um, are barred like there's bars on the windows so that nobody breaks in and you know i uh, knocked on the door and this lady older lady came to the door and she had these two big rottweiler type of dogs mm -hmm. and um for some reason i found that whole interaction, the deepest, most touching interaction. As I gave her the food, we never exchanged a word. I've never seen her again. But as I gave her food, the look in her eyes was of just gratitude, as if she mattered, as if mm. she was relevant. That's I, I like that word relevant. Um, yes. And it was, I felt it. I felt what it feels to help somebody feel relevant. Yeah. And as you say that, you know, that that's a heavy word. And um, I've also heard you say worthy. And, and those are not words I would normally associate when I think of food. You know, a, yeah. a woman, a human should always feel worthy. Uh, they should always feel relevant. You know, everyone matters. So I guess, you know, with powerful words like that, maybe speak a little bit about that connection between food and relevancy and food and, and worthiness. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of specific examples. I've had... Great conversations with people, men and women who experience food insecurity as a child. And many years later, they've had successful uh, careers. They have the ability to have food, etc. And I, as I have a conversation with them and the topic of food insecurity comes up, in every single time, every single time, the moment they reconnect with that experience, they, every single time, they get emotional. And what every single one of them has said is that they felt that they had, they, there was something wrong with them, which is why they, there was not enough food. There was something they had done wrong or there was something wrong with them. So it's really a reflection on the self, 
the circumstances are a reflection on the self. They don't have the ability to process that and saying, you know, why is that I'm hungry? It's really, am I worth it? Am, have I done something wrong? It, 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 you know, they're, it doesn't make sense to them and they can't rationalize it. And it is very deep very, very deep. Some of them have become food hoarders and, and have confessed to that because mm-hmm. it is it never leaves you. And they're experiencing hunger, experiencing hunger as a child, when you don't know why it is happening, it never leaves you. Those behaviors you mentioned, such as food hoarding, we see that in children everywhere. Children who have lived in fear of not knowing where their next meal will come from behave differently than their peers, and they have a very different relationship with food and access to food. I mean, a relationship no one should have to have, certainly when that young. And it's really hard to understand and describe. So, you know, I, I want you to take that a step further, because what we're talking about is a basic human right. Uh, you know, and being unsure that a need necessary to survival will get met. So take that further and describe your observations and knowledge about girls around the world and why you wanted Feed a Billion to focus on girls specifically. Well, so I have I have an experience as uh, as a child uh, where um, what I saw women having to go through and yet being steadfastly the rocks. And then when you fast forward that, we have seen that and and the data and research shows that if you want to create sustainable change in a community and an impoverished community, you have to empower women and girls because they are the ones that stay there and and help build and and strengthen that community. So you know this this there are several different parts to this so there is this part of women and girls create sustainable change in a community that's one part the other part of it is there are cultural issues around the world where girls are systemically discriminated against from very early childhood so if there is a family that has limited resources such as food, the boys get more food than girls do. And girls are the ones that actually end up working in the fields and outside the home and becoming servants in other families' homes. So the girls are being risked to go out. They're not going to school. They're not participating in any sport activity. And then they're not receiving enough food. So it's a cycle. It is. So when you see that happen on this side, which is that they're not receiving food, the other is that they are having to work. The other is that they are the ones that are going to bring sustainability to a community. What we have to do is create consistency of nutrition, consistency of nutrition, because the thing is, the problem has to be solved where it is no longer a question in somebody's mind, am I going to get fed? That should not be a question. Right. And to to your point, I I think the World Bank, uh, the last metric I saw said, you know, the greatest investment for any community is a girl. And uh, they, you know, assigned numeric value to it doing research. And I think it was every one year of additional education led to an 18% increase in potential earnings. And women and, you know, girls, I think 90% of what they earn goes right back into the community and goes into the family. And so it was like, you know, it's there's a very easy link between investment in a girl and and the future of a community Um, yeah and And, and we are seeing that you know our experiment in india the program that we did in a partnership um it shows that the combination of 
education, sporting activity, and nutrition, those things working together has reduced the chance that they were going to suffer, whether it is early marriages or, um, you know, other trafficking type mm -hmm. of things that happen to these girls. You know, 60% of them were at risk uh, and now it's zero in the community. That's When you say so, 60%, so, I, I just, I think that's really really difficult for a lot of people to wrap their heads around that 60% of girls don't finish primary school because they are married or sent to work in some capacity. I mean, yeah, that and then they're, they're, that's where the exploitation takes place. Mm -hmm. So there is, there, see, so when you talk about trafficking, it's not just sex trafficking, there's trafficking of labor. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. So there is all versions of trafficking and women and girls are at a much bigger risk than men and boys are. Not saying that it is not happening to men and boys, it is. Girls and women are at a higher risk. So what we said is that what if we focus on educating people that there is a link between nutrition and exploitation because of the vulnerability that it creates. See, yeah. the thing is, when there is hunger, what do you do? You're willing to do anything you need to do. Yeah. And it's as, as, as simple as that. So when, you, when we remove that worry from the equation, the anxiety that it reduces is significant. And, as you and, I've, I, and I've seen it. I've been there. I've been in the homes of these girls. And it is, I mean, they're the heroes because despite their circumstances, they're so optimistic. They're so engaged because they see that we care. They, they see that somebody cares, that somebody's there for them and, and is helping them push forward. That is a, such a booster for them. Yeah. Well, and I mean, as you talk about meals and, and what they can do, I mean, there is the the immediate thing we think of, right, which is, well, there's nourishment. You're putting sustenance into the body. Um, and there is that benefit of all of a sudden uh, you can develop properly, especially for a young person, a young girl, their brain, their body. I mean, they need nutrients to grow and, and to develop properly. So there's that part of it. But then there's back to that worthiness, that relevance that you talked to. I mean, for someone to grow and feel safe, feel secure, feel like they matter, like there's opportunity, to actually be given the opportunity to go to school is dependent upon food. Yes. And families, you know, are forced to make really difficult decisions. It, it's not as though, you know, any family wants to be put in this situation. But we've right. seen, you know, in every community all over the world, these things happen. And a lot of times it's not talked about. You know, families are embarrassed. Families look for alternatives. And, and I really think it's important to go back to your comment and just sort of reiterate, you know, when you use the word trafficking in, in certain cultures. And I can certainly say, you know, in America, we hear human trafficking misused often. And, and people automatically assign these things they've seen in a movie or something to what it is. And, and instead, you know, when you don't have a basic need met, as you just said, you'll do anything, literally. Yeah. I mean, we are at our core, we, you know, we'll do what it takes to survive. And, and thus exploitation can look like many things. And, Correct. um, the situations, whether it's cleaning a house or being married early, you know, the situations that girls in particular are put in are exploitative and and it changes who they are as a human. Um, yeah. I mean, there can be physical abuse. There can be sexual abuse. There can be, I mean, there's just all kinds of different abuses. You mentioned a few minutes ago about your sport partner, Yuwa, in India, and how Feed a Billion leverages local trusted partners to distribute food and supplemental meals like those that Blend Hub makes. Can you define for us then 
uh, how exactly you work uh, both with you know on a with people on a global scale and yet you keep it very local because what you're describing is happening in individual homes and communities and we know there isn't a one size fits all global solution to food insecurity yeah so we started in 2016 we formed the nonprofit in 2016 and since then we have funded uh, and distributed through our partner organizations close to seven or so million meals, you know, six and a half to seven million meals. And it's been in the United States, Kenya, and India. And we want to go into Latin America, and I, and I would love to go into some African countries and so right. on. Right, the three continents, that's impressive. Thank you. And And the trick in this is not trying to solve this by ourselves. It's about partnerships. It's about leveraging existing infrastructure and relationships and knowledge that exists in each one of those communities. So the idea is, so for example, in the United States, there, in, there is an existing infrastructure for mobilizing food and distribu distributing food through food banks and pantries. And there are government, I mean, there are umbrella organizations that are very efficient at working into that whole system. So why should we have to reinvent something unless there is a need to? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, if there is no need to reinvent, then we don't need to reinvent. We did a, a, a food giveaway for Thanksgiving here in Atlanta in partnership with Fulton County and we gave away 40,000 pounds of food, turkey, and so on and so forth. That infrastructure didn't exist. So we rolled up our sleeves and actually did it. But in other places, there is existing infrastructure where there are other organizations that are doing it. They know the community really well. So what we learned, which is what came from my business background, is we, we have to leverage we have to figure out how do we take existing resources and multiply those, the effect of those. And how do we find matching organizations that give us leverage on our money as well? So it's really a leverage on resources and leverage on money, right? So we have been able to be very efficient with the cost of each meal that we have provided because we have been able to find matching funds or we have been able to find partnerships that already exist and we don't have to bear the cost of that local distribution, if that makes sense, right? And just to clarify, when you say meal, like what exactly does that mean? Because again, you're talking about different cultures all over the, the globe. So, are, so what, is a, what there, do you mean by meal? So there are, so for, for example, in the United States, the meal is, um, it consists of, um, canned foods, fresh produce, dairy, meats, you know, things like that, that are distributed through typically through food banks and, yep. and food pantries and kitchens. In Kenya, we have done a couple of different things. We have distributed in certain remote north east corner of Kenya in those villages, we have distributed um, a, a, a mix of rice, beans, um, dehydrated vegetables, and a soya powder for um, a protein. And it's boiled, and then it makes kind of a porridge, and that's what people eat, right? And and we experienced in that scenario that, which you don't know, that distributing food in that part of the world is more precious than uh, gold. So we had to, you know, the, the partner that we had, they had to have um, security guards on the truck that had the bags of food. You know, people don't know that. People say, oh, here's, I'm going to write a check and you solve the problem. You know, there's a lot of details that have to be worked out in terms of ultimately taking it to that person that is going to eat that food. The other thing that we have done in Kenya is we have helped build through another organization, we have funded uh, a kitchen. So now it's a sustainable solution 
that they are going to be providing yeah. in school meals to children which is you know their uh, their uh, kenyan typical meal rice beans etc through that kitchen and i think they may be at like 20000 kids a day so you know we saw what their need is and and we're able to fund that in in india we have done a couple of different things one is um, we have you know we funded meals through an organization that already has an established network of kitchens and government funding um, but there is a gap in their funding and they provide midday meals um, hot meals the typical indian dal vegetable rice uh, bread meal to kids throughout schools in india then in uh, this uh, other program that we did with um, a, with an organization that has a sporting program combined with school just targeting towards girls, um, we saw that what was needed was a non-cooked solution because we had these girls mm -hmm. for a very short time and they were uh, they were available in the morning when they were going to their sporting field, the soccer field. So we had to intercept that in a very efficient way and give them the nutrition at the time. So we partnered with another organization that has a shake and we have mobilized the shakes that are given to these girls through the shakers. They, we gave them the shakers, yeah. they bring so, the shakers with water. To so the what field. we would think of is like a protein shake. Kind correct, of. correct. Yeah, okay, it, great. It's, it's exactly that. So yeah. it's a whey protein based shake, but it gives all the nutrients the body needs. So we know it's getting delivered. So, you know, it's really about partnerships. It's about leverage. It's about local knowledge. It's about, I mean, just to think about this, these 425 girls that receive this every day, they are going to 15 different fields in the morning at 5, 5.30 in the morning. These fields are soccer fields. But if I gave you a visual of what that soccer field looks like, there are no lines, there is no goal post, there is no electricity. And so in the morning, it is dark and there is fog, right? So these girls, you have, their safety is important. So there is a bus that picks them up at all these different locations. Then they go to 15 different locations. So we got to make sure that we can provide them these shakes at 15 different locations at 5.30 in the morning. And although I know that this is how it works, just hearing it said, like, gives me anxiety, like the logistics of coordinating. And that's, that's one program. That's and one. just one. Yeah. I mean, that, to think about all that goes into. And so when, you know, think about people donating, right? It's like, what, what can $1 do? $1 can provide a meal. And then when you play out what it takes to make that meal possible, whether it's a hot meal of roti, whether it's, uh, you know, a meal cooked in a kitchen, whether it's a, a protein shake distributed while playing. Uh, I like that you call it soccer, uh, fo football for the rest of the world. Um, that's a whole hell of a lot for one dollar to do. I mean, that's, right. Like that's actually kind of hard to process. Right. Uh, which is why it's then really, I think, so impressive that you talk about um like that global partnership that makes those micronutrients possible all the way to an actual sporting group or sporting, you know, field where you can hand them out. I mean, that's, right. that's really, really in, in, impressive. And also, and, and so I, you know, so the thing is that what I learned through this process, and maybe it's because of uh, the fact that I grew up in India, which was very different. You know, the environment that I grew up in is very different than the environment that I live in today, that I've been in the last 38 years in the U.S. What I learned is, and what this is what we practice, is that we cannot take our parameters of what we live with and assume that that is what happens somewhere else. We have to understand the specific nuances of very specific communities. So one part of India is very different than another part of India. The northeast of Kenya is very different than solving the problem in Nairobi. Solving the problem in south side of Atlanta is very different than solving the problem in L.A. or in New York. 
or it's in a rural very community unique. in Missouri. Uh, correct. So right? each community has its unique nuances. There are logistical issues. There are cultural norms. There are social norms. There is stigmas. In certain communities, it's a stigma to receive aid. So you have to do it very discreetly. And how do you reach a girl or a woman who is not allowed to have interaction or conversation? How do you approach her? You know, you have to go through the community with through the established norms very subtly. You can't you can't come in and say, I am the knight in riding shining armor and I am going to take this village and I am going to provide meals. It's not just about money. In one program, we didn't know that there are rats in, in these villages. So then we had to figure out how to protect the food. So we had to then get these uh, big metal trunks to put the food in, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot that it's, needs to be figured out. And you can't figure that out. Hear. Right. And you can't figure that out unless there is local knowledge. There is hands on the ground, boots on the ground, hands, like it's hands on. That's such a hands on approach. I mean, you really got to meet people where they are, not where you want them to be or wish that they were. Uh, also, what I really love that you said, I actually um, wrote it down as you were talking. Multiple times you said what we learned or what we didn't know. And I think that's beautiful. Far too often people who start nonprofits, um, I mean, they're entrepreneurial by, by nature, right? They see a problem and they say, I want to help solve this problem. But that often means you also come with a mindset of I know better, I know what to do. I have an idea. This will work. Uh, and you have to believe in yourself and you have to believe in your idea. But as you said, you know, every community is different. Every person is different. Every family is different. Every school is different. And, and so for anyone to show up anywhere and say, aha, I have a solution is, is really short-sighted in my opinion. It's, it's and, naive. And, and it's we see naive. That it's naive. And we see nonprofits in particular fail all the time. And, and so for you, I mean, five plus years later to still be going, to be expanding the countries and communities that you're working in and to willingly just say, we didn't know, or we learned. I, I just, I really do think that's beautiful because that's the kind of organization that is sustainable. One that yeah. grows with the communities it's in and one that adapts, um, like in Kenya, that example you gave of, of building a kitchen, I mean, that is a way to not only feed children, but it incentivizes families to send them to school because that's where the kitchen is, right? It employs people from the community. It uses local resources. I mean, yeah. people throw around the word sustainable. But when I hear that, I'm like, that's what sustainability is. You're, yeah, you're, and we experience that like in the northeast corner – um, when I say corner, I mean, it's a region. There's a lot of people there <laughs> <laughs> in Kenya. Uh, you know, we experience this. So the, the, the kids will, when, when, when they see the smoke in the chimney, they come to school because they know there is going to be food. Right. So, That's awesome. so I mean, you're talking about incentive. And in fact, we've experienced that in India as well you know, less so in the United States. But actually, you know, even in the United States, I have firsthand and observations of uh, kids um, in school um, filling their pockets and jackets on Friday because they are concerned. These are tiny kids, elementary school kids. They, they are concerned that they will not have food on the weekends and they try to put it in their pockets from the school. And I mean, at the very beginning of this conversation, you you use the word hoarding. I mean, that's one of those yeah. hoarding behaviors. Children's right. behavior changes based on their access to food. And and that's absolutely remarkable and something they shouldn't have to do. It, yeah. Children shouldn't have to be planning ahead and hiding things 
uh, to make it through a weekend. That, and that's right. I and, mean, and that and example's and here in the U.S. Yeah, it, it's in the United States. It's mind-boggling. You, you, it is. You, know, you will be shocked at how many people have food insecurity in the United States. You will be shocked. It's it's literally the you know, people that are listening this. Just go around in your neighborhoods within a mile of your neighborhood, I guarantee it, you will have more people food insecure. I don't care where you live. Mm -hmm. You will be, you will be shocked at how much food insecurity is. And, you know, going back to something that we were talking about earlier about this pivoting thing, right? So this whole pivoting, I've seen that in business world, right? The only way we have been able to be successful in the businesses that I've been, if I track it, why it is, it's because we know how to adapt and pivot. And any business that doesn't do it is out. You have to. I mean, the problems that families face, the incentives that they need are always changing. And certainly the people who exploit children are always pivoting. You have to meet the global problem but you simply can't do it alone. The thing is that we can't solve this. It's a global problem and it's a massive problem. We have to partner with people that are in the food insecurity um, space and people that are in the trafficking space. Yep. Whether it is a nonprofit organization or a technology firm or a government entity or a think tank, you know, all of these different entities, we need to be able to bring them all together and have a conversation that there is a link between food insecurity and trafficking. There is a link between food insecurity and exploitation. And we I think can't that's... simply just try to do it ourselves. We have to bring other people into it. We, and you're right. We have to bring other people in. I think, you know, part of the importance of this conversation is how few people link food security to all these other systemic problems in every culture and yeah. and how especially for girls especially because it, for girls and for, and by because, providing one meal you can change entire outcomes for one girl there is no need for feed a billion to exist there is no need, there shouldn't be a need right. for the World Food Program to exist. There shouldn't be a need for Feeding America to exist and the food banks to exist. There shouldn't be a need for us. That is what success looks like to me. Then that brings me to the big picture and your overall purpose at Feed a Billion. In an ideal world, with AJ having unlimited resources, what would you do with Feed a Billion? I would do everything that we can do to become completely non-existent and irrelevant. Uh, that is the only sustainable solution. I do hope that in your lifetime, Feed a Billion isn't needed. Uh, I, I love what you said about, you know, when you started it, you had a vision to feed a billion people. And yet, you you know, in India alone, there's a billion and a half. There's well over a billion girls in the world and and hundreds of millions need food. And and so I, you know, I think it's really important at this point that it's it's not about a set number of meals provided. On any given day, we need to feed a billion girls. And and that is I mean, that's an exceptionally lofty goal, but um, I, I believe I believe in your mission. I believe particularly in the way you work in communities um, that it's it's possible um, because what you're doing is really touching each football field, each school, each community in ways that hopefully this next generation of girls, they get to graduate. They get to yeah. choose the career that they want. They Absolutely. they plan a life for themselves where they feel worthy. They feel relevant. They feel heard, seen. And I, I think it's, it's absolutely wonderful that um, one meal a day can make that difference. Yeah. 
And and you know, there's something else that I've learned in this process of this journey, and it's you know, we have a need as human beings, we have a need to connect, we have a need to be loved. And 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 the way to connect and the way to love is to give to connect with somebody else it's not that i want to receive this love the only way to receive love is to give it <laughs> unconditionally that's right and yeah. and food is love it's it you know think about this for a second right what do we do when we want to celebrate a wedding we eat together we mm-hmm. want to celebrate uh, graduation. We eat together. We want to celebrate with friends. We eat together. What did people miss during COVID? Getting together for meals, right? So, in families, in individuals, you know, getting together. Why do people have depression right now? Because they have not been able to go to restaurants. Why? Because it's communal. It's together. Food brings us together. That is an expression of love. If I ask people, and I've asked people, when you think back, there must have been at least, at least one instance in your life where you had a meal with somebody, whether it was your grandparents or a friend or your mom or your dad, whoever, there was somebody that you had a meal with that just felt in your heart. And so far, I have never met somebody that has not had that experience. As you say that, I the reason I was laughing is because uh, it was actually my grandmother. As you said, <laughs> think of someone. I was like, my grandmother, food is love. That that quote from you is defines my grandmother. Uh, and that is who she is. It's who she's always been. It could be midnight and you show up. And it's, what do you want? And all of a sudden, everything that she can give from the kitchen, she gives. It is. is, So I'm the same way. It is. The the kitchen is always open. Whatever you want to eat, I want to feed you, right? So there is such a joy in Mm -hmm. giving that experience to, to somebody. And that is when we receive it back. So people are looking to be loved well love somebody <laughs> feed somebody feed someone food is love i love food that. is love so how can people reach you aj how can people contact you or feed a billion what's the best way for people to show their love to you and 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 help feed a billion uh feed girls all over the world so it's feedabillion.org that's our website you can check us out you can donate and to contact me, you can just say, uh, send an email at aj at feedabillion.org. AJ just letters at feedabillion.org. At feedabillion.org. Yeah. Excellent. See? Okay. And I receive them and I will definitely respond. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for your vision. And and even more than, than vision, thank you for putting your time, your energy, your money uh, your community, your family, all the yes. things that you have sacrificed to make Feed a Billion possible and to persevere because I know it's not easy. So so thank you for all that you do. Thank you. See you, Nicole. Have a great day. You too. And thank you, everyone, for going on this first of many adventures with us. Be sure to subscribe. It will help ensure we can continue to bring you weekly adventures. And I know it can be a pain, but please rate and review. It makes all the difference. Every five-star rating and review will move us up the list so others can learn about the show. And last, send us a story. Share with us who you know, maybe it's even you, who's doing something absolutely remarkable to make the world a better place. Or even if you just know some random story that helps us understand the world around us, send it. We want to hear it. Stories at theglobalgoodpodcast.com. We'll be sure to read your email. This week's episode was researched and written by me, Nicole Roberts, 
with audio and production by Willpower Productions. Images and videos were provided by Feedabillion and Blendhub.